your smiling face. Good morning. Uh, make sure y'all have not seen Linda today. Catch her and uh, speak to her and tell her hello. Uh, and uh, as I reflect on this weekend and the nature of God's goodness, uh, just something that has been on my mind the last couple of days was uh, that young lady right there just went around and giving hugs and, and our struggle with uh, kids ministry and youth and asking the Lord to do something with youth here. Uh, many of y'all probably don't know what you probably heard my word about this weekend today, that we hosted the Lafayette on Friday night. It was her and some of her friends and seven young men from Cleveland Clergy, Big Blue Clergy Town, Down the Beach, that's the Clergy Town, Down the Beach, choir, choir and um, choir was formed. We were, we were very busy. 
starting our Christmas cantata. If you're here for the cantata, you can, you can leave after that, and then the rest of the choir will continue on with the, the songs. Today, you're all going to be choir members because we're going to sing a song together from a choir track, and it's called, Because He Lives, Amen. Let's stand. And if you can put a little more in here. All right, let's sing, and we can get the words, please. I believe in the sun. Thank you. I believe in the risen one. I believe I've overcome. And if we could put a little more. By the power of his blood. Amen. third and final week of Jeremiah, and we even got to discuss it in community groups today. <laughs> this is week number 34, and it was called The Judgment is Here. Very appropriate because the reading this week has been very negative and dark, but it shows us God is a God of great patience. He's a God of many second chances. Jeremiah's name means appointed or sent by God. And the main theme of Jeremiah is the judgment of Judah with restoration in the future messianic kingdom. The final chapter is the fate of Jerusalem. 
Now, he was called as a young man at the age of 20. He ministered 40 years to very rebellious people who did not want to hear what he said. From the time of the good Judean king of Josiah's 13-year reign in 627 to beyond the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon in 586 B.C., and you can really see this week why he was called the weeping prophet because of everything that was happening and nobody was listening. But when he prophesied, he knew the northern kingdom of Israel had already fallen to Assyria. So he told the people of Judah, repent or judgment is coming to you. He points out the people's sin. Backsliding is actually used 13 times in the book of Jeremiah. The invader God would send would be Babylon. 164 times Babylon is referenced to in Jeremiah, and the harshness and destruction of living under a siege. Our reading ended, get, ended with Jeremiah predicting the judgment of God on other nations is also. There's a list of about 10, 12 other nations he told about their faith. During his ministry, Jeremiah was very emotional, wrote about his feelings a lot, he was hated, treated harshly, dropped into a muddy cistern, left to die, told not to marry, humiliated, threatened, put in stocks, persecuted by a false prophet. He wanted to quit many times, but he spoke without anger, and he covered his message in tears of compassion. And it, it's very challenging to read Jeremiah also because the book is not chronological. It is arranged loosely thematically. So prophecies that appear together may have happened years apart. I was very lucky. My Bible actually has them listed out so you know which kings, which chapters to read. And I'm going to close our reading of Jeremiah with something I read this week, and we mentioned in our, in our community group this morning. Jeremiah's job was to try to turn the people's hearts back to God, even though God knew it would not happen. Jeremiah, though, did not give up. So if you're in a ministry or job where you feel like your actions aren't bearing much fruit, hang in there like Jeremiah. Your responsibility is not to make results happen, to be faithful and obedient to God is your job. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the words of Jeremiah. We need to heed your words and warning and assurance today. Thank you for your daily presence in our lives. No matter what happens, no matter what we're facing, we are so grateful you are there. Give us courage to share your love to a world that really needs you. We give you praise, for we know your love is forever. So shine your light in us, through us, and over us. And we may we make a difference for you and for your glory today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Good morning. This morning's reading will be from the second chapter of Luke, looking at a passage where two people who had served God for their whole lives got to see his promised Messiah, starting in verse 29, where Simeon took Jesus up in his arms and praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace, as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. At Calvary, let's stand.
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time together. We just pray that your Holy Spirit will go before us, instruct us, and teach us. And we pray that your tithes and offerings will be used to further your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there, or sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So today, as the title says in your bulletin, I want us to linger. Last week we talked about racing, this week we're talking about lingering. And we indeed can race and linger at the same time, and I'm going to talk about that as we go through the message today. But if you look at the front of your bulletin, I don't know how many of y'all this scene looks familiar. We are fortunate enough, fortunate enough to live in a state that, and in the part of the state, that's an equal drive to the beach as it is to the mountains. I love both of them. If you would ask Carrie which one she prefers, she would obviously say the mountains. She went to App State and just loves the mountains. And so we try to spend some time in the mountains every year. And one of my favorite things about the mountains is seeing a picture such as what is on the front of your bulletin. If you haven't been to the Smoky Mountains, they're called the Smoky Mountains because the clouds sit over the mountains and tend to linger on top of the mountains, making it look like smoke, making it look like the mountains are on fire. But it is literally the clouds just lingering. And sometimes they will linger most of the day. And so as we think about that, if you have been to the mountains and you have seen those clouds linger, I want you to think about lingering today. But Maybe for those that haven't been to the mountains, maybe those that can't picture that picture of the clouds over top of the North Carolina mountains, I'm going to give you a few other things because I want you to grasp this concept of lingering because there is such sweetness in lingering. There is. Maybe it's lingering in the taste of something delicious. I love sweets. I love a good piece of chocolate mousse pie. I love ice cream. I love, I, love, I love a lot of things, I can tell you that right now. But having that taste of something so definite and rich linger in your mouth. You don't want to eat anything else because you want that taste to be what lingers on your taste buds. You could probably all think of something that you have tasted that is delicious, that you enjoyed the flavor of, that you just wish that flavor would stay in your mouth forever. Maybe it's being in the company of somebody that you really see as remarkable. That you could just think, I could linger here all day listening to this person talk or being in their company because they exude such a wonderful personality. Maybe it's a feeling of delight, something that you really enjoy feeling and you want to linger in that feeling of joy. Maybe it's a view of something amazing. We go to Bush Gardens almost every year, and the tallest roller coaster, I believe, in the park is the Griffin. And how the Griffin is set up, it has this kind of curve at the top. And when you get up to the curve, you can see miles upon miles around the entire park you can take in, and you can see much of Williamsburg from the top of the Griffin. And part of me just wishes that I could just stay up there a little bit longer, that I could just continue to look out over this view in which I don't have any other opportunity to other than the few seconds that we are traversing that top of the track. Maybe you can think of another view in which you just like to linger in. Maybe it's the glow of a sunset or the sunrise over those mountains that I just talked about or maybe over the ocean. Maybe a, a moment of ecstasy that just feels sweet, like the cool side of the pillow. You ever flip your pillow over and be like, oh, 
would it not just stay like this all night? But you know that coolness doesn't last long. It's a fleeting moment that you try to linger in. Some of you may just like to linger in bed in the morning. That Saturday morning, while Carrie wasn't at home, I think I hit snooze six times. And that's very unusual for me. So it just felt like lingering in the bed that morning, not getting up. Or maybe it's the final words of a goodbye. The sweet embrace before somebody leaves. Some may play those words over in your mind and try to linger in that person's presence through those words. There are many things in which this world and this life have to offer that we desire to linger in. And I want us to think about that, though. As we think of worldly things that we enjoy lingering in, I pray that you spend time lingering with Jesus. Many of us are busy. We have to-do lists, we have schedules, we have places to be that often take us away from focusing on Christ. We are often preoccupied with the next task, the next person to talk to, maybe the next meal we're going to eat, maybe it's the next activity you've got to take your kids or your grandkids to, in which we then forget to linger with our Lord and Savior. And there is no better example of lingering other than Mary. Mary offers us several different examples of her lingering, and not just this Mary, but Mary in general throughout Scripture. There must be something about Mary's that like to linger with Jesus. And so we see Mary Magdalene here on that Easter morning. We ended last week's message or last week's passage in John 20, verse 10. It says the disciples went back to their homes. They all left. They saw the empty tomb and Mary decided to linger. Mary decided to linger outside the tomb and she was weeping. She was grieving. She was missing her Savior, her teacher, her close friend over the last three years, the the one that delivered her from torment, the one that set her free from the demons that possessed her, the one that gave her new life, a different take on the world. There was a hope now about her that was different. And so in the loss of Christ, she was grieving. She didn't return with the disciples, but she stood at the tomb. And again, I want us to think about that grieving process because grieving for each one of us is a unique process. We all handle it differently, and Mary chose to stay. She chose to weep. She showed a desire to attend and to reflect and to linger with Jesus. And I want to encourage you to think about this today. Some of us do our best racing, standing still. We talked about racing last week in which the women got to the tomb and they saw that the body was not there and they raced back. They ran back to tell the disciples. And then we see Peter and John racing to the tomb. But now we see Mary pausing, waiting, grieving, thinking, lingering. Best times come as we think and reflect on Jesus Jesus even showed us that, I believe, at 12 years old, his parents had gone to Jerusalem and they packed everything up and they left. They got on the road and a home alone moment happened and they started searching and they thought Jesus was in the group, but he, he wasn't. So just like Kevin's mom hollered, Kevin, in the movie Home Alone, now imagine they were like, Jesus, where is he? We don't know where he is. And so they go back to look for Jesus and where do they find him? lingering in the temple, talking to the teachers and the scribes. And he told his mom and dad, where else would you find me but lingering in the presence of my father? He was lingering when he needed to linger. Anna and Simeon, as we see them in the temple waiting, Anna specifically who says that she goes and lingers in the temple every day, waiting for the Messiah to come waiting for him to be presented. And it paid off in which she got to see Jesus. 
as we relate this to something in today's world as football season starting. Some of y'all probably sat in front of the TV yesterday, either watching preseason NFL or the kickoff of college football. Much of an athlete's time is spent in a film room, not out on the practice field, not in the weight room, but looking and sitting and thinking and reflecting on their own performance and the performance of those that they're facing. Look, church, we must spend time reflecting on who Jesus is, on his work in our life, his work in the lives of those around us, his work in the church, his work on the cross, and how his work has changed our hearts. And again, this is no different from Mary She is sitting and thinking and reflecting. She has, I believe, literally blocked out the rest of the world to attend to Jesus. We must take time for that. And so the text tells us she stoops back into the tomb and looks. She's already looked. She knows the body's not there. But she finds herself reflecting and thinking. I imagine she desires to be with Jesus We still go to grave sites today to linger, to reflect, to think about the people that we love, desiring to feel like we are in their presence to a certain degree. And so Mary is there still at the tomb, desiring to be in Jesus' presence, desiring to be with him. And we see how distraught she is. Just think about that if it happened to you. If you went to the cemetery to see a loved one, and you got there, and the grave had been disrupted. The body was not there, where it was supposed to be, where you had been, where you had seen the body laid, as Mary had seen two days before. You would be distraught. You would not understand the situation. She, too, I imagine, was distraught as she looked back into the temple or into the tomb, and what do you think, or what did she see but two angels? And so she has this simple conversation with the angels, and she says, I want to know where he is. I want to know where he has gone. Where have you laid him? But then yet her attention is drawn outside. And so she she turns and looks out of the tomb, and there Jesus is. And again, where have you laid him? Thinking this person is the gardener, she doesn't recognize Jesus to begin with. And sometimes we look at this passage and be like, How did she not recognize him? But I think Jesus in his supernatural ability did not reveal himself to her yet. And so she says, I will take him away. Where have you put his body? I will go get it. Again, we talked about the foot of the cross in which we see the lady standing at the foot of the cross and yet the soldiers casting lots over Jesus' clothes. They were distracted and disengaged and yet the ladies were divinely devoted We see that again here with Mary. This divine devotion is completely evident in her attitude, her willingness to do whatever she could do. Where is his body? I will get it if you would just tell me. And Jesus first says, woman, and then simply addresses her as Mary. And he says, Mary, it's like uh, the scales that fell off of Paul's eyes. Or Saul's eyes were revealed. Uh, A new revelation was revealed. Just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus who walked with Jesus did not know who he was until they sat down to break bread with them and then their eyes were opened. Mary's eyes were opened when when he said her name. She recognized him. If we look back at John chapter 10 verse 27, he says, look, the sheep will hear my name. They will follow me. They will know me and they will hear my voice. Mary heard his voice. She heard her name being called by her Savior. And she recognized him. And our challenge today is if Jesus calls your name, are you listening? Would you recognize that it's him calling you? Do you have your ears open? A heart devoted to hearing him. That's our question every day. That's a hard question. Do we wake up listening? Do we wake up ready to hear the voice of Jesus? And immediately she recognizes him and says, Teacher, 
And I'm not sure what Mary does here, but I imagine she falls at his feet. She says, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended. Again, this is a foreign concept to us. We've never really been face-to-face with somebody that's risen from the dead. And so we see Mary approaching Jesus, and he says, don't cling to me. And again, thinking through the chosen, we saw that women almost never hugged men. It's just not how culture worked in that day. So I imagine that it was not Mary trying to embrace Jesus, but I imagine it was Mary falling at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him, praising him, a spirit of thanksgiving that he was there. He says, I have not ascended, but I've got a mission for you. You will be rewarded. You get to experience me in a way the others have yet to experience me. I will ascend, but I have not yet. And what I'll need from you right now, Mary, is a simple task of going and telling. Does that not sound familiar, church? Go and tell. Go and tell the brothers, not the disciples, not the servants, not friends. Has, has, he has referred to the disciples in past times of Scripture. Go tell the brothers, the brothers and sisters now in Christ, something changes upon the resurrection. Our relationship with Jesus changes or changed upon the resurrection. As it did for the disciples and for Mary, their relationship is different. They're not following him as they followed him before, but they have been Crafted into Jesus' family as brothers and sisters. We too have that right as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a new relationship with Jesus. Not necessarily servants or friends, but brothers and sisters. And he tells her this specific message. He says, go tell them. He says, I am going to ascend to my father and your father, to my God. And your God, go share that with the brothers. I want you to think about that statement for a second. And what Jesus was saying, the power of that statement, my God and my Father. But they're not only mine, but they are yours too. Your Father and your God. Ownership. We have ownership in Christ. And through Christ, we can come to God as my Father and my God. There is significance in that. He's not some random stranger. He's not some mystical God in the sky that we can't relate to. But we have personal relationship with Him. And as we think about that today in today's context and setting, we can say it's His church and our church. We sit in a building, true, but we as a collective people are his church. And this is our church. There is a level of ownership in that through Jesus Christ. The beauty and magnitude of that. And we are in a building, yes, but we are together today with five other groups of people that claim the same thing. That claim to be his church. And they are literally our church church it's not just us sitting in this room today for this hour but it is so much bigger than what we understand and oftentimes fathom because jesus said it is my father and your father and my god and your god we too now are bound up in such unique relationship that transcends boundaries in many ways that transcends our understanding of relationship in which Now Jesus Christ is the head and he has ownership and we are with him. We are with him in his mission. We are with him in his desire to seek and save the lost. We are with him as we worship. In church, we are with him as we linger. It says, I have seen the Lord as she went back to the disciples with this wonderful message. I have seen the Lord. She declares it with boldness. She relays his message just like she was commanded to do. Again, we see devotion and obedience. Devotion and obedience. 
We saw that this morning in the story of Baruch and Jeremiah. Faithful obedience. We are all called into that devotion and obedience. And if we claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he has given us specific instructions. One is to gather. And it is such a joy when we get together, not just on Sunday mornings, but on Wednesdays for prayer and Wednesday evenings to gather together. That is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to fellowship with one another. We're supposed to worship. We're supposed to encourage and equip and grow. We're supposed to go. We're supposed to be on mission. We're supposed to be obedient, desiring to be image bearers of Christ. And in that relationship of Jesus, we have the powerful, powerful good news of the gospel. And just as Mary went back to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord, we too, those that have been saved by Christ, we too have that same statement, I have seen the Lord. And as y'all go forth, he has charged us all with saying to those around us, I have indeed seen the Lord. Have you seen the Lord? Paul writes in one of my favorite verses in Romans 1.16, He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I am unashamed of the gospel. Mary was unashamed to linger outside of the tomb that morning, to weep tears of grief, to be committed to doing what she needed to do. She was unashamed to run back to the disciples and claim that I have seen the Lord. Are you unashamed to run out these doors, declaring, I too have seen the Lord, and the Lord indeed has changed my life? I want to encourage you in that today, and as we move into a time of communion, we too are called into obedience for communion. As we gather together as people, the Lord commanded us to observe this Lord's Supper, not just for formality's sake or for ritual sake or for tradition, but to remember him, to remember his goodness, to remember his grace, to remember all that he has done for us. And as we prepare to take communion today, I'm going to offer a prayer and then read part of John 14. So let's bow our head this morning. Thank you, God, for your message, for Mary and her devotion unto you, for her desire to stay, to seek you, and to share you. God, lead us into that too as your people. Give us a burden, a deep burden as your people in the church to carry that message faithfully that we too have seen the Lord. That you are no longer dead, but you are alive. You have risen, and through your risen power, you do give us new life. And this communion is simply a reminder of that. That as we follow you in obedience, this is part of our reminder in which we get to share with you. Let us treasure and linger in this moment in which we take this bread and juice. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. In John 14, Jesus is saying, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. We do indeed know the way, church. The way is through the cross. It was Christ's work on that cross that gives us new life and is we have celebrated Easter in August. What a sweet time to reflect on communion. What a sweet time to reflect on this passage that Jesus is the way. And Jesus says, I am going back to the Father. And I am preparing a place for each of you. He has done a wonderful work, church. And we have a new hope. A new life in him as we celebrate who he is. As we take and enjoy and commune with one another today. In the Lord's Supper. Melody has a basket right down here in the middle. If you didn't pick up a cup this morning, you can stick your hand in the air and she will gladly bring one to you.
I believe the words of Jesus. I believe his words are true. Why would he not go and prepare a place for us if that's what he told his disciples was happening? And that his followers indeed have hope because of the story of Easter. He didn't stay dead. And because he rose from the grave, that allows us the freedom to live with a hope that conquers death. A peace that surpasses the problems of our life and the world around us. A peace that we can truly find when we linger with Jesus. So for these next few moments, I just want you to close your eyes and linger. Linger in a time of thanksgiving. Linger in a time of repentance. Thanking Jesus that he went to the cross for each of us. Linger in his presence. hard part about lingering is it's usually never long enough. It's a brief moment. A time in which we can grasp at. But I pray this week church will be full of moments for you to linger with Jesus. Look around and rejoice in his goodness. We'll peel back the top and if you take out the wafer we celebrate We celebrate the fact that our Savior allowed his body to be hung on a cross so that we may have life. Linger in that thought as we eat of it. And likewise... We symbolically drink this juice as a time of remembrance of his blood shed for us. We must recognize that, yes, indeed, we are all sinners. No matter how good we might wake up thinking we are, or how many times we have our back patted, we are indeed sinners guilty of playing a role in putting our Savior on the cross. As we drink, linger in the work that was done. The fact that Austin was able to preach just a few weeks ago that Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished so that we may have life in eternity. We should be drinking. Again, gracious Father, I thank you. Thank you for your people and your church. Let our hearts and our minds dwell in the company of the Holy Spirit. Let that Holy Spirit direct us as a church that we would truly seek your will above all else. That we would be a church set on mission not resting in our own salvation, but eager to see the salvation of others. Put that longing in our heart for others to be saved and for our communities to be changed because there is a revival brewing in the good news of the gospel. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Again, the altar is open if you want to have a time of prayer this morning. If you just want to come up and linger at the foot of the cross this morning, Feel free to do so as we close in song. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses 
and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever